we had arrived and everything for PMI was the blue and white uh, logo colors, all the branding that you've grown accustomed to the past uh, 20, 30 years. And then on the last day, uh, they launched uh, uh, their new branding, which was a surprise to most. A few chapters were let in as uh, guinea pigs and test beds, uh, but uh, brighter colors, uh, more lively fonts, uh, symbols that we didn't know what they meant. And I think a lot of the local chapters around the world were a little tensed up. Uh, many chapters had put in uh, thousands of dollars in branding from uh, polo shirts to t-shirts to pins to mouse pads uh, with their logo on it. And all of a sudden they found out that uh, there not only was their logo changing, but now you had other chapters who were, uh, had an early preview and uh, within your same region and in large areas such as ours in DC, uh, there's uh, five chapters within uh, 60 miles for you to choose from. So in the larger markets, it is competitive. In the smaller markets, it's a one-stop shop. Uh, so uh, I think uh, in October, we were curious as to what was the cause for the change. Uh, what did that mean for PMI as we knew it? it and as we learn more, uh, over the last uh, eight months, uh, we've learned that it wasn't just a, a style content, that PMI under uh, the new uh, president and board of directors team is really committed to uh, looking at, we're, we haven't done, we're not doing project management in the real world how we did it uh, 10, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, now that everybody needs an integrated master schedule uh, or typical waterfall in the five phases that PMI has tested us on uh, since 1991 uh, on. Uh, there's easier ways to work smarter and not harder, uh, agile uh, framework and uh, hybrid uh, foundations are in place. Uh, so we can adapt quicker, especially in the software development world. Uh, there's so much change and uh, so much adaptability that sticking to that uh, waterfall schedule and promising and a no later than date isn't always feasible. And I think as we grow in the 2020s, uh, fighting that uh, the traditional waterfall uh, practitioners on what they expect and uh, with customers a lot of times they want to hear uh, this needs to be done by an exact date and they don't want to hear from the development team well you know like we'll do uh, phased integrations and implementations and we'll, we'll see how it goes so uh, we'll be talking about that as well okay so uh, just to kind of set the stage, we'll talk a little bit about the history of PMI and project management in general, uh, what project and program management looks like today. Uh, what was the change? Uh, we'll be watching a video from uh, the current PMI president uh, and what that means for members and then what the trickle down is to our chapter and uh, local chapters around the world. Uh, we basically receive a, a framework and uh, some bylaws of which to follow, but each chapter has a lot of leg room in terms of what their program looks like. Uh, we track our soft skill presentations versus hard skill presentations and try to keep it as close to 50-50 uh, throughout the calendar year as we possibly can. I think that's important. Uh, uh, not everyone wants to hear something down in the weeds in terms of uh, process control and uh, estimating frameworks, but that is important to hear. And it's also important that you understand uh, leadership, the soft side of change and change management, because as we continue to adapt and change with technology, uh, getting stakeholder buy-in and making sure that everybody's input feels valued is uh, 
uh, becoming pretty important and can be detrimental to your project, uh, both at the onset and in sustainment uh, to be successful. Okay. Okay, so uh, when you look at the history of project management, uh, there's not, I think a lot of things are new to us, but not necessarily new to the industry. Uh, so as we kind of walk through uh, top to left, or uh, north to south here. So uh, we're all accustomed to Gantt charts. Gantt charts have been uh, in the world for over a hundred years and a century now. So uh, with a lot of uh, agile development, uh, you may not be using Microsoft project. You may not have to report a Gantt chart to leadership. Uh, for those new to project management and who learned under uh, Pinbach uh, versions one through uh, pretty much six, uh, the Gantt chart and what was behind it was a big part of uh, your uh, education to project management and how it was done. Uh, critical path is the first question that you're going to get when you put a schedule in front of somebody uh, that's been in place since 1957. So this is a lot of these things aren't new in the big uh, scheme of things. Uh, work breakdown structure, uh, 1962. And even with all uh, those core things that come with project management 101, uh, PMI wasn't founded until 1969 uh, in the great city of Philadelphia. So even with all that time uh, where you had uh, tools and techniques in place, there wasn't actually an association or a governing body like over over that until uh, many years later in the case of the Gantt chart. Uh, Scrum and Agile uh, to some have come out of the blue and is new, but uh, Scrum's been in place since the mid 80s. And uh, Jeff Sutherland, one of the creators of Scrum, who uh, has some good books on how more, not so much how to build a Scrum team, but more like what a Scrum mentality is like his first scrum projects working with Toyota and NASA and how he got those C-suite or major government stakeholders uh, to buy into a scrum approach, which at that time was completely outside the box. Uh, with many of our clients and stakeholders, they still don't understand scrum, even with scrum Alliance and uh, PMI uh, agile practitioner training becoming more commonplace. I think pretty much every, area where you have a PMI chapter, there's a scrum trainer uh, and agile uh, shop available to uh, enlighten those on what scrum means, what it means to be a scrum master, what it means to be a product owner, how big a scrum team should really be. Uh, earned value management uh, seems like it's been, it should have been in place going back to when the critical path and the Gantt chart was, but earned value management didn't come about until uh, the late eighties. And then Agile kind of took its place with the original Agile Manifesto at the onset of the 2000s and our current century. So uh, even though PMI and the PMBOK uh, with the Agile Practice Guide that was uh, accompanied uh, PMBOK 6 edition uh, in recent years, uh, things have been around for a while. I think PMI is uh, catching up to it. And I think our industry is uh, finding it necessary to have different means of uh, different frameworks to complete work that one size doesn't fit all and doing things the waterfall way just because that's all, how it's always been done or what our clients are exposed to isn't necessarily uh, the best approach uh, for the funding that you have in place and to grow your project managers. Uh, open it up to uh, our attendees. Do you feel that Agile is new in your uh, working places or do you think that there's a comfort level that uh, many are used to it and it's not that hard to get buy-in? 
uh, for running projects through Agile or through a Scrum framework. Hi, this is uh, Lou Wellenitz. Um, I think at the uh, my current client agency, um, Agile's relatively mature, although they have some um, very much cemented processes which require us to kind of use a, a modified version of Agile Scrum. Um, and so we'll run sprints up through, you know, um, we'll basically plan a release, plan out a number of sprints, and then after that have to run software, excuse me, I work in IT, um, run software through some pre-prod environments and so forth. So um, we sort of had to negotiate that with them. And it's, you know, it's been going on for a number of years and it's, you know, it's worked out generally pretty well. And so Agile isn't anything particularly new for them. Um, and uh, they seem to have a great deal of comfort. And, you know, one of the great things about it is, um, I think is one of the big selling points about the whole Agile philosophy is it really forces product owner, you know, or client participation in the process. So, you know, unlike Waterfall where you get to the end and you may end up with a big surprise. Um, you know, we're delivering software that they asked for, you know, that's, I think, particularly for a vendor is tremendous. Um, that certainly reduces our risk in that regard. So anyway, but in terms of comfort level, uh, which was, I think your question, it's, uh, where it's nothing new. Yeah. And, uh, thanks Lou. And, uh, great points in terms of, uh, a more shared sense of ownership. It's not just the project manager, the sponsor who are taking uh, responsibility. I mean, if you look at the RACI matrix uh, framework, you can only have one uh, A for accountable, but I think in terms of response, shared responsibility, it's uh, more shared across uh, in terms of getting user stories uh, approved and then the test criteria uh, for acceptance for those and making sure they do tie back to some type of uh, minimal viable product uh, for And in uh, chat, uh, Mr. Sam, uh, Sandage uh, brought up that uh, I think Agile is a buzzword right now. And a lot of project managers and uh, C-suiters look at it still as a buzzword because it doesn't necessarily go back to execution and how it's supposed to be done. I mean, one size doesn't fit all in terms of what the scrum teams look like and what agile framework is but it should at least follow some uh, degree of repeatability across the board and a lot of people say they're agile but they're not really uh, even in my environment right now working as a federal employee with the uh, air force headquarters uh, everybody's like yep yeah we're doing agile we understand you know uh, incremental product delivery that type of thing but then they always want to go back to an ims of well like, when is this going to be completely done? And as uh, Lou alluded to, when you're dealing with software licenses and things of that nature, yeah, you do need end dates. So uh, I think that's where a lot of hybrid project management is probably more popular right now uh, across the board. Uh, but it all depends on uh, the customer and what the mission is. Okay, so uh, to that uh, point, what's relevant today? Uh, like, do we need an integrated master schedule? Uh, what does project governance look like? And how repeatable and reoccurring does that governance need to be? The architecture review boards, the project review boards, the change review boards. What do those really need to look like in terms of what can be done virtually uh, versus what needs a meeting? And then our project management offices uh, that vital right now to overall success. 
Like I've seen a lot of environments that don't have a PMO that are, would be hindered if there was a PMO just because of how the operations are. And there's some PMOs that are keeping their organizations and clients afloat and they'd be lost without them. Uh, so we're going to uh, pivot to a quick uh, poll right now. Okay, uh, so for those who have a mobile device handy or uh, a computer in front of them, if you could go to uh, menti.com and uh, type in the code that you see and just answer that. Uh, how many of us are still using the IMS during our projects? Uh, either as a hybrid approach or just straight waterfall. And we'll give a few minutes for those answers to come in. And for those not familiar with uh, uh, Menti, uh, just another uh, polling tool, Poll Anywhere works. I think uh, if you adapt your Zoom license to include webinars versus meetings, there's a polling feature uh, in there as uh, Ms. May enlightened us on uh, last month. Uh, so uh, a lot of good tools when you're holding meetings, especially when you have virtual stakeholders, uh, in these COVID times, uh, it's good to I'd say if you have more than 15 or 20 people just to pull the audience, even if it's something as simple as, uh, do you wanna take a break or do you wanna keep going? Having everybody come off mute to state or state it in chat is a little overwhelming at times and uh, people can talk over each other. So this is just a good way to assess uh, it's, uh, a free license at the start and you can make it more dynamic and hybrid to include company logos and uh, we had a post uh, summit happy hour yesterday where uh, it was used as a trivia game so there's a lot of bells and whistles in the tool uh, this meeting isn't sponsored by uh, Menti, but uh, just throwing that out there while we get some answers uh, so it looks like from uh, our results uh, we're at about uh, three quarters saying that sometimes we're using an integrated master schedule and then sometimes we're not uh, I think not every not every schedule is going to call or every project is going to call for needing the IMS and IMSs aren't easy to work with I mean a lot of IMSs are uh, integrating and combining like six or seven different project files uh, as we use uh, more portfolio management software instead of Microsoft Project, it's online and web-based, either uh, through Office 365 and Project Online or tools such as ServiceNow that have like that portfolio scheduling dynamic. Uh, it sounds easy to bring in everything, uh, but it's not as easy as a lot of people think it is. And I've seen a lot of cases both in the private sector and in government professional services where they're like, oh, we have a scheduling tool, but you look at, at what their schedule or IMS really is and it doesn't make sense. Not every task has a predecessor or successor, so it can't be baselined, uh, things of that nature. Uh, can I get a few volunteers to chime in who answered sometimes and an example of what a project looks like that does have an IMS and one that doesn't? Okay, we got a great uh, comment from Mr. McCullough that scheduling is typical, but integrated scheduling is much more difficult. Uh, Mr. McCullough, can you use some examples from uh, your client if you'd like to come off a of mute? Oh, um. Can you hear me? Yep, sure can. Okay. Welcome. 
Okay, I was, I was sitting the wrong way. Sorry about that. Um, and just being a government contractor, uh, I think that the concept of integrated master scheduling is uh, is understood, especially by people uh, with a PMP background or industrial engineering background. Um, uh, the, uh, the the challenges are getting the schedule is get, are getting the schedule baseline, maintaining the baseline, and uh, integrating 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 the schedule in a cross functional manner. It's more talked about notionally than anything. And the worst the worst thing I can say is when I say when I when, I, when my real disappointments are when I go to meetings and I hear people talk about uh, they're going to talk about the schedule. What I see is stuff on PowerPoint. <laughs> I say a meeting to myself. There's no way you can possibly be doing serious integrated master scheduling, let alone scheduling per se using PowerPoint. And I've talked to some other SMEs where I work and they, they, they fundamentally agree. In fact, I've, I've, I've heard, I've been in conversations where I've heard people say, look, I had a lot of respect for you until you said you wanted to use PowerPoint or Excel to do a schedule. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, j j uh, you know, the key word here is integration. In integration alone is so difficult to pull off, not just in scheduling, but if you can talk about integrated data management, integrated project scheduling, integrated program management, integrated anything, okay? Uh, because integrated anything involves, involves change, a lot, involves a lot of cultural change. And I think really the, the, biggest, the biggest challenge in integrated project scheduling is, is cultural change, frankly. I won't say I haven't seen it done because I was a, I, I used to work for Eastman Kodak, and um, we did a lot of serious integrated master scheduling. But where it was done seriously was we had it was under the control of the Industrial Engineering Division, and um, and uh, those of us who did scheduling, if we needed somebody to consult to or somebody to, to vet the work we were doing or talk to somebody about which tool we should be using, we had a PhD who was doing it full time, and he was usually contracted by some of our uh, some of our top programs. Uh, so, so all of the all of the master, I should say, all of the major. I'm going back a ways in years, but all the major uh, innovative programs we have, we always had a serious integrated master schedule driving it, and we typically had. It was so serious. We, like I said, we had PhD, uh, a, a PhD in charge of it, and other people usually with uh, engineering degrees for the most part. So it does happen in the world. I think it's I think it happens a lot more in the commercial world than it does in the government, frankly. In fact, uh, uh, the old timers, when I used to work at Kodak many years ago, the old timers told me that when they that when we did the uh, the Manhattan Project, Kodak actually had the contract for doing the integrated master schedule for that. Wow, interesting. Yeah. Uh, do you feel that PMI and the curriculum has put you in a better position to either create an integrated master schedule or be able to fix one? Or do you think you're kind of been left well, I, in trial and error. I, I in the, when I got when I first studied for my PMI, in, in addition to reading the PM book twice, like like some of the other certifications I've worked on, um, I also bought all of the specialty books the PMI offered, and they have they have one on scheduling, as I recall, and it it it, it basically covers all the fundamentals re very well. The first time I learned about it was uh, I was going through the MBA program uh, back in the '80s when I worked for Kodak. Okay. And I worked for them before that, even. But um, uh, I integrated schedule, integrated master scheduling was talked about. The term per se was not used in the MBA program back then. It was more. Uh, we had a lot of discussion on critical path methods and the, and the PERT technique. And uh, the, the the course, the two courses I had to take to get my MBA were were operations management. So in most MBA curricula. Operations management is where the topic comes up in today's academic world. I'm sure they probably talk about it, but where integrated master scheduling, that term tends to get a lot more usage and support, probably even more by PMI, it gets promoted by the American Production and Inventory Control Society. In fact, a lot of the uh, MRP and today's ERP systems, they typically have a, they typically have a, a master scheduling module built within it, and it supports the whole notion of integrated master scheduling. So I would say anybody who's support anybody who works for a manufacturing environment where they're even attempting to do enterprise resource requirements planning. I mean, an integrated master scheduling module and component is a major part of getting the whole uh, production planning and shop floor control and the whole, the whole uh, MRP, MRP2 feedback loop working. So it, it's, it's a very, very uh, viable concept, but like I said, it needs, it's something that needs top management support um, I wouldn't say it's necessarily, necessarily has to have the C-suite support, but it's got to have top management support because it, it's got, it, it requires cross-functional interaction to make it work. Over.
Yeah, definitely agree on that. Uh, I think it's definitely evolved, and but at the same time, I even as a, a certified uh, PMISP, the scheduling professional myself, I mean, you, I still encounter uh, some bumps in the road, and uh, both on the technology side and on the uh, change side, and getting people to give up their uh, piece of the pie and let their cafeteria tray uh, morph into more of a buffet line. Yeah, Roger uh, that for sure. So to speak. Uh, Beth, uh, did you want to kind of explain your comment a little bit more in terms of your experience? Sure. Um, so while um, Thomas was talking about, or Tom was talking about um, use in ma for manufacturing uh, and, in, and also use in commercial domain, I just wanted to chime in that it's the integrated master schedules are still being used uh, by defense agencies and defense contractors and even government contractors uh, for civil agencies. Um, for large programs. Uh, I'm currently on a very large program for a civil agency and uh, the integrated master schedule is a critical element of that billion billion dollar um, contract to my company. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a $12 billion endeavor. So um, integrated master schedule is absolutely essential and the integration being that of you know multiple different functions having their own schedules that tie into that integrated master schedule right so it's not just manufacturing it's not just commercial but it's very much still in play for government contracts and Danny, do, you you as a oh, do you attribute that more to that's how government's always done it so they're more hesitant to adapt to simpler and maybe easier ways of doing things? Or do you think that the work is so dynamic and spread out across uh, different resources and organizations that it's necessary? I think it's both. Um, personally, I think it's more of the latter uh, because I don't think there's an adequate substitute. There is some um, agile development going on um, on my program uh, but the end date for after all the sprints are done it, there's still an end date for when you're delivering you know when you're done delivering capability against that product uh, to the product owner and that end date is in the IMS in the integrated master schedule so I, I think it's more the it's some of each but I think it's more the latter that there there is no suitable replacement for a very large very complex program with lots of moving parts This is Tom McCullough again. Uh, the, I think the, I could probably rephrase your question as saying, when is integrated master scheduling appropriate versus some of these scheduling uh, me methods we, we hear about in the Agile environment? Um, where Agile doesn't really work is when the pro was when the uh, the product and the process are very well defined. The more the more defined you have the outcome, the less applicable Agile is. And uh, I think the other thing that it has to bear is, like Beth just mentioned. And these, some of these multi-billion dollar programs, uh, it's worth the time and money to put in integrated master scheduling as, as a risk management tool. So that because, of, because of the amount of effort that goes into it, um, you can justify that when there's a lot of risk involved. And having worked a lot of proposals for Lockheed Martin and Lidos, typically the, the process we go through is you develop a system engineering management plan, then an integrated, ma then an integrated management plan, then the integrated master schedule. So, uh, if the project has enough risk and enough uh, enough resources that it requires, uh, an integrated master scheduling sooner or later is going to be needed just just to just to manage the deal. And uh, if anything, it might there might be some agile approaches that might uh, it might involve in some of the individual activities within the schedule. But there's so much in the uh, management of the backlog that integrated master scheduling can help with that agile doesn't really. Rest. I mean, Agile starts where the back where the backlog backlog of, of work actually gets handed off. So I, I agree with Beth. And the bigger programs and the bigger governments like NASA, I'm sure, uses integrated master scheduling. Uh, any any time you have lives involved, like where the Air Force has to put pilots into a seat, it, it's it's rare to see a, a major weapon system get done without an integrated master schedule. Yep, uh, definitely agree. And I mean, I think the like if you're on IMS, you're looking at all your late tasks and uh, tasks that are behind schedule and then oh, yeah. uh, 
when you're doing backlog refinement and uh, more of an agile, I mean, that's the work that needs to be done. And uh, backlog grooming is uh, pretty pivotal to project success. Uh, Akin, um, you wanted to share uh, your experience? Is that me you're trying to call Akin Tokumbo? Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. So, 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 yeah, my, my name is, I mean, that's my name up there. I mean, it's so interesting because I started working in Agile since 2012 when I was a business analyst at um, CGI at the start of the Obamacare requirements gathering. And then I left that job and I came on to this project I am on now. So everything Tom has discussed here and what May has discussed here is exactly what is going on my project. And now because of the integrated master scheduling system and how we manage backlogs and all that stuff, we have now integrated two tools to actually help us do the real work and then do all the discussions. And that's where we now brought in JIRA and Confluence. So now, the greatest experience I've had is that this, because I'm not really a project manager on this project. What I've been is a program manager. So when I got my certification in May, I started to try, okay, let me see what's in the market. I got this interview. This is where Tom's and May's um, discussion comes very, very alive for me. So I put out my resume there, out there in May, and, and, and some, some company called me, government project. No different than what we do on my project here because I work on free projects. One 600, 600 million, one 500. So, all together, the money, so we have to use the master scheduling. So at this interview, this guy asked me, he said, do I know anything about scheduling? I'm saying, yes, I know about scheduling, integrated master scheduling. He said, um, that's what we want you to come and do here. And I said, wait a minute. I said, wait a minute. I said, to do this job, I have to be a subject matter expert in scheduling. So he, he, he said, wait, he said, wait a minute. So everything Tom and May have said here is that what, what I'm deducing from this is that if you really, really want to work on an integrated master scheduling tool for a huge project, you have to just be a master in using the master scheduling tool and all that stuff. That's what I just wanted to share. And I'm not sure if that resonates with Tom and May whereby you think that somebody who just knows project management can just come into master scheduling. It doesn't work like that. On my project, we have two. We have two master schedulers, and we don't even touch. We don't, we don't go into that boundary. We just say, okay, what do you have for us that we're going to take to the PMR? So they tell us what to put, what tools we use, how we use Jira, how we use Confluence, how we integrate all the backlog, because for the master scheduling, for the, for the scheduling on my project, where we get issues is exactly where we have to integrate the three projects together. We have one six million, we have one five, um, 550 million, and I think we just won one for about maybe 350 million. So when the master scheduler is working, two of them work on this project, two master schedulers, they probably have maybe 20 years as engineers, just exactly what Tom said. You have to really go to school, get your PMPM scheduling, get a master's in accounting and all that stuff. Then you settle into that tool very well. And then the tools make it so complex that you just have to concentrate on that alone. That's what I just have to bring to the board. And just like I said, because I just got my certification in May, I wanted to start, I wanted to try my hands on actually PM. And I saw that, wait a minute, for you to actually be a, for you to be a senior or technical project manager, you have to have that master scheduling experience. Not that you have to know it, depends on where you want to do. Because I mean, project, there's a lot of there's a lot of pieces you can pick from. Scheduling, change management, blah, 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 blah. 
Anyway, that's my five cents. I just wanted to share that. I uh, know. Yeah, we appreciate it. And uh, I know some people are thinking uh, that the presentation's not tied to what it was advertised, but I mean, this is our pivot point to kind of show is PMI uh, as an association that we pay a uh, hundred and uh, $60, $70 to renew our certification, preparing us and keeping us competitive with doing the work that's expected uh, in these digital times and environments. I don't think as much, like um, there's 1900 certified uh, PMPs in our chapter of 2300 right now. And there's only eight uh, PMI SPs for the scheduling professional. I'm one of them, but I think that shows that scheduling has been overlooked and just because you have a PMP doesn't mean that you even have experience in scheduling and uh, can pull so off the, the big bear that is an integrated master schedule. So uh, PMI leadership every uh, four or five year cycle uh, has a new president and CEO uh, similar to uh, political administrations and uh, uh, other technical and uh, association uh, term positions. So, but with each new leadership comes a different vision. And uh, Mr. Sunil Prashara took over in May of 2019. And by October, you had a full rebranding uh, strategy with the colors. You had a pivot that we're going to go away from the five phases with just a little bit agile to more uh, not just be so process based, but the principles of project management to better suit our project managers. So uh, he had a recent interview with a news outlet to kind of explain where he's coming from. Uh, I think in his words, uh, it's better than just me regurgitating what he said. Uh, so we'll play that video uh, for some on zoom. Uh, you may, uh, the video may be choppy, but the audio should be uh, pretty uh, static. So we'll meet back here in about four minutes. President and CEO of the Project Management Institute, Sunil, as part of Project Management Institute's renewal, you've launched a new focus on what you're calling the project based economy. What do you mean? without the boundaries of finance, HR, legal, etc., and the people you need in the organization should all be able to be well-versed in project management risk clearance and the ability to execute, because they'll be called upon to do that moving from project to project to project. Now, what skills do project managers, and if everything is being projectified, professionals in general need in order to thrive in the project economy? Well, you definitely need to have a very strong understanding of technology. 
technology is helping project managers and other professionals to optimize the way they do their work. So leveraging technology, leveraging big data to give you insights as to what your next step and decision should be. We call it the technology quotient. Not necessarily being a software developer, but having appreciation for how technology can help you is very, very important. When you look at specific skills, you still, you can't run away from scheduling, planning, iterative processes for development, governance, risk management. You know, you also have to be able to pick the right methodology uh, for how you execute on a program, on a project. The third skill set is empathy. And here's something that technology really can't uh, get its arms around. Professor Tabrizi from Stanford University calls these the power skills. They used to be called the soft skills, empathy, cultural awareness, ability to be able to say sorry, uh, the ability to be able to be human. A few years ago, these were soft skills and the hard skills were, can you create a Gantt chart? Can you do an Excel spreadsheet? Can you manage a month end close? Concrete things which today are automated, systemized, codified. And those softer skills are now being called the power skills. They're the things that make things happen. So these are some of the skills that we advocate as PMI. You have to have an appreciation and understanding of the hard skills. You can't get past home base without that. But what makes you stand out is when you have the softer skills and the power skills to make things happen. So well, thank you very much. Thanks for watching. Click now for more from Sunil on how technology is changing project management and strategy. Okay, uh, so it seems like for some, there may have been some difficulties, so we'll um, copy the link um, in chat uh, for you. But I think uh, my big takeaways from uh, the president's uh, message in there was that uh, hard skills aren't enough anymore. Like, I mean, historically, why, didn't, why don't engineers run their own IT projects or construction projects? Uh, because uh, they didn't have that expertise in the soft skills and to work with people across the board. Stereotypically, engineers have gotten the uh, bad rap that they're more introverts. So the project manager was expected to be uh, that extrovert. Uh, but I think uh, what the bottom line on the messaging was, was that we need to... Uh, continue to adapt and uh, PMI did a great job of putting out uh, curriculum stuff. The PMP was a great assessment of, do you understand the, at least the initial foundations of project management? But I think now as a hiring manager myself, I looked at a PMP as a high school diploma. I was like, well, what else do you have? Uh, where not to diminish the accomplishment, uh, but there needs to be more. I think in the vetting of uh, experience on the PMP certifications and some of the other PMI certifications, as long as you have the right buzzwords, uh, you're not going to come up on the audit search and uh, you'll be able to take the test. And a lot of our uh, training partners are great at making you prepared uh, to be in a position to pass the exam, which isn't easy. I mean, uh, a lot of with the exception of a CISSP or a few other exams that are longer than four hours. The, PM, the four hours that the PMP exam takes is, uh, can be pretty daunting, uh, but what does it mean to be a PMP? And I think uh, Suntil uh, has kind of seen that and that's why he adapted what we're gonna go over uh, here in the back part of the presentation. Uh, so uh, the concept that uh, PMI is currently working is uh, the project economy. Uh, so more going away from processes and principles with a portfolio of projects, what integration truly means, not just on a schedule, uh, but also in terms of uh, working together and making things sustainable and better for the future. Uh, they've taken a, a human centered design is a big uh, uh, buzzword right now. And when you peel the onion back a little bit, it all Design language, human centered design, uh, it, more of that 
uh, instead of just deliverables and processes, but just what do the people think about those? And I think uh, PMI has done a good job of identifying what that design thinking looks like for project management across the bar board, regardless of what framework you use or things of that nature. Uh, so uh, the symbols aren't just for show, like uh, even with our logo, uh, they kept uh, the P, the collaboration and the determination symbols and gave us some wiggle room on the change. Uh, so uh, when you look at our chapter, uh, and I saw some work to do on the website rebranding to finish it out, uh, but the change uh, across PMI and the only point of flexible, they did that on purpose. So the Baltimore uh, lower right uh, logo is a crab. Uh, ours is a sailboat from Montgomery County. Uh, that's the only thing that should differ in every PMI's chapter's approach. And I'm not sure if they always had that before. Uh, so when you think collaboration, uh, there's a reason why it's called a project. It's not just a single task. Uh, you need to be collaborative with all your stakeholders and all your project teams. Uh, we need to continue to innovate. I think innovate may be the most important on here. Like we can't continue to do things the way that, that they've always been done. And with innovation comes growth. Uh, if you have that visionary uh, who is bringing innovation to the table and carries on collaboration, uh, everybody's going to grow. Uh, the visionary is going to learn what works and what doesn't about their vision, but uh, everybody who's carrying out that vision or even the people who are fighting against the vision are still going to grow by seeing how things work. So I think every organization needs that visionary. Uh, being at headquarters Air Force and uh, in the five side castle known as the Pentagon, uh, there's plenty of visionaries around and I have the great pleasure of working for one. And it can be demanding because things change a lot, but that shows that he's continuing to grow in being the visionary and the setting out that course. And uh, from time to time, you're gonna have to change course. Uh, determination, uh, I think, uh, the definition of a project is being temporary in nature, that it has an end date. So you need to be determined to get that either completed or if it is going to be canceled, canceled for right reasons. That there's a shift in strategy, not because it was so behind schedule and uh, so uh, behind over budget that uh, it got canceled, more canceled just because it didn't fit in the strategic framework anymore. Uh, teamwork goes with collaboration. That's why you see those colors in orange. So if you look at it from a tic-tac-toe perspective, collaboration, teamwork, and community are all orange. You need all three of those things for a project to be successful, in my humble opinion. When you look at the purples, you have innovation, vision, and change. All those go together. And then if you don't have growth and determination, the lighter blue colors and outcomes, or if you don't have growth and determination, you're not gonna receive the outcomes that you want. So. They all kind of go together and everybody can tell us stor the story with those nine symbols the way they want. Uh, there's not one canned speech that PMI is stating to describe this because every organization is going to be different uh, in terms of how they use that. But I'd love to hear somebody who would say that one of these nine isn't necessary for your projects to be successful. You may get by with one or two uh, being successful without applying these prim these principles and practices, but uh, it won't sustain, in my opinion. So how do we learn and why now? Uh, Projectmanagement.com has been a great resource over the last three years, uh, four years in terms of providing content for the PDU seekers who the reason why many of us are PMI members is just for PDUs for certification. Uh, instead of spending your uh, lunch hour with me, which I greatly appreciate, and we've had uh, 60 core attendees on the whole call, uh, there's a lot of people who I know who start a webinar, uh, do some errands, run around, come back in an hour, and then close it out, and they get a PDU for that. So that's one of the bad things about uh, projectmanagement.com, but the fact that those webinars even exist, and if you do have a message, uh, 
as a practitioner of project management in your own careers, uh, it, applying for to record a webinar, uh, it's as easy as uh, just doing a Zoom call with yourself and just uh, recording it and then uh, sending that video to PMI. Uh, project managers across the world can learn from your experience and still get that one PDU credit. Uh, there's a great deal of templates on projectmanagement.com. Uh, a lot of them are boilerplate and need a lot of work, but at least it shows you if you're entering a new office environment that they don't have any existing practices or what they're using isn't working and you don't have your own toolbox to save the day from your prior job, uh, projectmanagement.com templates are a great way to start to kind of uh, impress your client or customer and get things on the right track. Uh, during our opening comments, we talked about the virtual series, which is PMI's take on more TED Talk type thinking. And they even did do one uh, PMI TEDx event. Uh, for those not familiar with TEDx events, there's like the big global like TED conferences that have millions of viewers and attendees, but there's also TEDx events that any local group can do. Uh, locally here in the DC area, uh, Georgetown has a, a TEDx event, uh, University of Maryland does, uh, George Washington University does. So it more, they have a theme uh, for all the presentations and then it's just done on a local level, local organized. Uh, Ted sends you like the Ted letters for the background or stage, but that's about all they do for you. Uh, the rest is grassroots, which can be pretty effective in messaging. So PMI is starting to go there more with virtual content. And I think you'll be seeing more PMI YouTube videos uh, to watch of speakers that you can send out to your peers, project teams, uh, even your uh, subordinates, because we always have to coach them. Uh, we have a question on chat. Is there, is there a TEDx PMI coming up? Uh, I'll get that information out uh, to all the attendees. Uh, PMI Globals, uh, if you go to their website uh, under uh, training and learning, uh, there's a thought leadership uh, menu subset there. Uh, they do a pulse of the profession survey every year, which uh, informs leadership how their profession's going and will allow PMI to continue to adapt over the coming years in terms of how things are being done. Uh, it's, I mean, Scrum came out in 1986. There's a, a good chance that the next Scrum uh, could uh, pop up uh, this decade and a whole new way of doing things that nobody had ever thought of before. Uh, so PMI is putting their ear close to the ground to understand how project management and program management are being done, which is good. And then uh, based on those survey results, they do a deep dive uh, study, uh, a couple hundred pages of content into one topic. So 2018 was forging for the future. 2017 was more culture and commitment and more that, that softer side. If your organization culture is weak, your employees aren't gonna be happy and that's gonna trickle down to your deliverables and productivity not being all that great either, in my opinion. And even though they have some competition with uh, other agile organizations and associations, Scrum Alliance, uh, for example, uh, they have launched a PMI Discipline Agile uh, framework and toolkit. Uh, there's six new certifications that uh, go across the Discipline Agile uh, a way of uh, business practice. Uh, and those are certifications going back to opening comments. If you have a training education allowance, uh, beef up your resume. Uh, not so much just for uh, your future job search, but also just to provide as much value to your organization as you can. Uh, Agile is basic in its infancy, but uh, the more better you understand Agile and the more you can be dynamic uh, in your practice of it, I think the greater your organization can be. Uh, there's also been a pivot in education uh, that with uh, just as uh, major movies are being uh, delayed because of production, uh, the PMI work outside of Philadelphia uh, and Campus Square, Pennsylvania has been a little bit delayed too. So 
they were anticipating the seventh edition of the Pinbox to come out in quarter four of this year, so October through December. There may be a delay on that, and we may not actually see the seventh edition uh, released, which is uh, a free download with your uh, valid PMI membership uh, until maybe March at the latest. But what you're going to see when that comes out is there's uh, a big pivot point to the principles and the nine uh, symbols that we went over uh, in the prior slide with just the, the five process groups that we've been used to. Like when you do your project schedules now, your project may not fall into that uh, initiating, planning, executing, monitoring, control, and closure phases anymore. And that's not a bad thing. You don't have to uh, put stuff in those uh, uh, higher categories just for the sake of doing it if it doesn't do any good other than say, I'm sticking to the pin box. Uh, so I, I think that'll be a really good thing to see. And then uh, whatever process you use, be it predictive, agile, waterfall, or hybrid, uh, the principles should stay the same in terms of how you're communicating with your stakeholders, uh, the integration points and making a project bigger in terms of a portfolio. Uh, you won't have to buy the portfolio management body of knowledge or the program one. I think you, you'll be in a, we'll be in a better position for success as project managers and program managers and project team members with this new addition to Pinbox. So uh, that's one of the reasons why I'm looking forward to it. Okay, uh, with a new PMBOK means there's going to be a new uh, new exam rigors and uh, exams tested on that edition. So we don't necessarily have a date for that yet. But one thing with the exams that did uh, come out late last year was uh, with many other uh, associations and their certification exams, you can do online proctoring where you have an external webcam. Uh, that shows your entire dining room table to make sure you're all in good faith and ethically sound. And you can take the exam just being monitored by somebody sitting somewhere else in the country or the world uh, for your two hours, four hours, whatever the exam length is. So PMI has finally uh, adapted to that in uh, December with uh, four of their certification tests. So right now for anyone online that doesn't have a PMP, or if you're interested in uh, more agile practicing, uh, I'm a certified scrum master and the workshop that you have to take uh, to be in a position to take that open book test was beneficial and you're working as a team and you have the sticky notes on the board and you understand the uh, Kanban board more, uh, but it didn't really, test your retention of the knowledge much. And any open book test is gonna be uh, not as easy as it sounds, but it's still not the rigor that PMI has held you to for your PMP and other exams where you can't have notes, you can have some scratch paper to write down whatever's in your head as soon as you take the test and that's all you have. So I think I'm more impressed when I come across agile certified practitioners than certified scrum masters or certified product owners personally. And they'll also be, uh, in the four hours will be split up into two parts. So when you finish that first part, you'll have a 10 minute break if you're doing the at home proctoring. Uh, so you don't have somebody walking you to the restroom like you do right now with your PMP exam to make sure you're, you're not cheating or have something written on the uh, restroom wall or things of that nature that some testing centers hold you to. So I think that's a good, a change in the right direction for PMI and one that I've been waiting for it for a few years now. Uh, podcasts, everybody has a podcast now. Uh, for the fans of the popular NBC show, The Office, they're up to like five or six podcasts this past week, either going over uh, week by week episodes and deep diving into those or just a overall history with the cast. And uh, it seems like everybody has a podcast uh, right now. So PMI has joined the club. I think there are a lot of project management podcasts out there, uh, good, but they're not necessarily carrying out PMI's messaging. So it was important that PMI came out with, this is our podcast, this is the messaging we wanna put out there. So it's called Projectified, uh, your iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, whatever app you use for podcasts.
podcast searching, it should be a listing there. It's a quick hitter. This isn't like a two or three hour drawn out podcast. Most of them are between 20 and 35 minutes. And uh, I found them beneficial and they're in my weekly rotation. So I'd uh, recommend that uh, you consider that if you're a podcast listener and if you're not, maybe just give it a try. Uh, so what does that mean for our chapter in terms of uh, trickle down? So PMI is changing the way they do things to uh, be more beneficial to how project managers are working today. Uh, so all the chapters should as well. So even little things like providing a lunch and learn session during the week. Uh, the Goliath, it's PMI WDC with 11,000 members has been doing lunchtime events in the past, but uh, they're a well-oiled machine have a lot more resources, but uh, with the virtual tools that we have now, it's uh, I think it's the right timing for us to launch events that you can do on your lunch hour and uh, get you back to work before uh, 1300. Uh, we've experimented with the chapter book club. Uh, we look forward to bringing that back uh, in late summer. Uh, we'll also have uh, some mind melds in terms of uh, more prac app of projects and uh, not necessarily real projects, but if you're in a waterfall environment and you don't have the opportunity to do agile, this would be a smaller community for you to work with, like on a, a prac app of a agile project that is just used for learning. And we can learn together as a chapter and as a community. Uh, mentoring sessions in terms of the mentoring program. Uh, we have a lot of members uh, out of our member base of 2300 that have 20, 30, 40 years of experience. And we have a fair amount of members who are just entering the industry and are looking for guidance. Uh, we can't provide face-to-face -face networking right now uh, because of the pandemic, but uh, Zoom calls and phone calls and trying to help people uh, in their careers is what it's all about. And even those with 50 years of experience need a mentor as well. Uh, all coaches have coaches and uh, all mentors have mentors. And more outside the box presentations. You heard from uh, the PMI president that it's not uh, just hard skills anymore and there needs to be a good balance of hard and soft. Uh, when I did the initial analysis of the, I think at that time it was like 14 years of programs in the chapter, I was surprised that just magically the ratio of uh, technical to soft skill presentations was pretty close to 50-50, but we have made a stride when we plan out our calendar to make sure that uh, we're achieving that. And also uh, last uh, week we had uh, our first uh, transgender presenter uh, talk about what inclusion means during these important times in our society, uh, making sure we're as inclusive of leaders and uh, project managers as possible it probably has never been more important. So even though some would say, well, that wasn't really project management, it did tie in with leadership and with PMI's talent triangle, uh, leadership is uh, its own area of focus. So servant leadership and strategic leadership uh, need to go hand in hand. So we as a chapter look forward to uh, continuing to deliver value to you. Uh, Mr. Geis is our president, has always thought it's all about the members. Uh, we're only charging $20 annual dues and uh, with that is a lot of free training, free dinners when we can offer them, free symposiums. Uh, your, the dues that we receive are uh, so we can give back to you, uh, not that uh, we can just enjoy being board members. And I think some PMI chapters around the world have kind of lost that. Uh, all PMI chapters are nonprofits, and I think some operate as a profit business, but we don't. And, uh, we don't plan on ever doing that. So uh, we're about the members, we value your membership, and uh, we hope we are in the privilege of your time today. So any questions or uh, comments from the group uh, before we uh, all get to our professional afternoons? Okay, uh, a lot of uh, good questions and uh, positive uh, energy in the chat column. So I'll be copying this uh, 
transcript out and we'll respond to all those uh, questions and uh, make sure I get links out in the uh, link with the YouTube link. Uh, if you found this beneficial, um, send it out to whoever you think would uh, get something out of it. Um, there'll also be a post experience survey shared at the end of the, uh, I should get it out by the end of the night. Uh, so if you have feedback from me as a presenter, uh, if I didn't quite hit the mark, uh, feel free to be honest with me and that'll improve our programs going forward. So we thank you for your time. Have a good weekend and stay safe. Thank you, everyone.